Hey guys, how's it going? Kevin Cleary here with a knife video for you. Today we're taking a look at the uh, Spyderco Swayback. I wanted to call it a Sleash. That does tie in because this is a Martine Sleash design. Very popular maker, but I want to address a couple of things first off. So this has been a knife that elicited some pretty negative responses, and I think there's a couple of good reasons for that, largely related to people's expectations about what this could be, which it definitely is not. Okay, first of all, I think people expected sort of a Sleash buoy two okay and that's not what this is secondly i think people expected a more traditional swayback again that's not what this is thirdly i think people expected sort of a, a modern tactical folder and again that's not what this is and so if you bought this looking for any of those things you were going to be disappointed from the start and i think you probably should have known that before you bought it but nonetheless that's uh, that's i think a lot of what goes behind the fair the the somewhat and by the way i do say somewhat there have been a lot of people who really like this and actually i'm one of those people uh, but there's definitely been some negativity around this and I get it because if you bought this looking for any of the things I just mentioned, you know, you were definitely disappointed. Uh, let me come back a little bit to the the situation that is re are surrounding the Sleash Bowie. Nick, I love Nick and he really loved the Sleash Bowie because it's too small uh, and he likes knives that are too small. So because of Nick's love for the Sleash Bowie, a lot of people, you know, really got on board and there was a lot of hype and there still is a lot of hype surrounding. It. And the normal thing to do in that case when there's market demand is to meet that market demand. And so Spyderco should have just made Sleash Bowies. I don't know why they still haven't done that. Um, and really, this is the best way to handle one of the more negative things about our community and all communities, by the way, is this whole thing about supply and demand. When supply and demand gets a little sketchy and everyone wants it and there's not many out there, people go insane and pay these ridiculous prices. Right now it's happening with the PS5. I heard yesterday there was a news story where uh, this guy was selling a, a, a PS5 for $1,000 and instead of paying him the thousand dollars, the people that he, you know, arranged to meet on Craigslist robbed him and took the thing. And eventually they were caught by the police. And I'm like, why? Right. If, if it retails for five hundred dollars or I think it, in Canada, it retails for about five twenty five, I think. And there's no way I would be willing to ever pay more than that in a million years. I would rather not have one than pay more than retail. And that's just a rule that I live by for all things. When there's a market demand for something, I'm like, forget it, right? I'll look for an alternative method to get my hands on it. But because of the limited supply of Sleash Bowies, there was a high demand. This happened. This happens over and over again in our community. And the best way to handle it is for manufacturers to do, and this is exactly what Rick Hinderer did to his benefit and the community's benefit. When hinderers were in stupidly high demand, he arranged for a better manufacturing facility so we could make more. It was simple, okay? Uh, and that was a great move and it, it benefited uh, the company, it benefited Hinder, but it also benefited the community. And if that's the situation, you know, like the Holtz, uh, you know, a Holtz Spectre is a great $400 knife. I, I, I hesitate to even call it a good $500 knife um, because, it, I mean, it's just a titanium frame lock with bearings. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, but, they're going for ridiculous prices right now, and it's because what what the what the Holtz should be doing is looking at how they can crank up production and begin to offer a diversity of models. All right, and that's that's how Rick Hinderer handled it. He increased production, he increased diversity, and it was a huge win. And that's the best way to handle that situation. And it alleviates a lot of the pressure and it alleviates people spending stupid amounts of money, right? The fact is you could spend $2,000 right now on a whole Spectre. You still only have a $500 knife, right? So anyway, um, that's, that's a little side rant that's unrelated to this review. <laughs> Uh, it does frustrate me as someone who likes knives and who likes to see people get great knives, right? I would love it if everyone who comments on my videos and talks to me on Facebook about some of the knives they want that are super hard to get, it would be great if you could get them and, and not have to pay an exorbitant fee for them. And by the way, that doesn't benefit the maker. Those fees are secondary market fees. So everyone loses on this deal. Right, even the people who have them, they still lose because they ended up paying an exorbitant fee. All right, so that's that's my rant. I'll, I'll move on with life after that. But I wanted to point out that you know the hype surrounding Martin Sleesh and the Sleesh Bowie is a lot of what built 
bad expectations into this particular knife and it's not going to meet those expectations this is not the sleesh bowie 2 all right so having said all that let's get back to our main point here all right and that is now that we've kind of examined our expectations and pointed out what this knife is not let's talk a little bit about what it is and what it is is a really cool really interesting gentleman slash light use edc knife all right it's it's high end it's classy it's interesting it's got some nice features it's different all things that i find appealing but it's not yeah, it, it's it's a little bit specialized and it's not going to be for everybody. And I think that should be the main thing that you, you see here. If you look at this knife and you go, wow, that is beautiful and it's classy and it's interesting, then you won't be disappointed, right? If you look at this and go, it's not a Sleesh Bowie, you're right and you shouldn't buy one, right? If you look at this and you go, it's not a zero tolerance, zero four, zero whatever your favorite zero tolerance is, again, that would be, you shouldn't buy one. If you're looking for something else, get something else. And I think that's the main point that I want to make here. And, and as I review this, I have the challenge of reviewing it for what it is, not what it could be, not what I want it to be, not what the community wants it to be. And so I have to look at this as sort of a, a Sunday carry, a gentleman's folder, a light use, classy EDC, uh, high end, of course, classy EDC. And so that's how we're going to approach this uh, as as uh, we work the rest of the way through the review. So I'm not going to be complaining about, let's say, the blade shape or or certain particulars that it doesn't have or does have that the Slash Bowie doesn't have or some other folder doesn't have. All right, so size and weight, 8 and 1 16th inches. So it's a little over 8 inches long, 3 and 9 16 on the blade, 4 and a half inches on the handle, 4 inches of grip area. The one thing this does have, especially in a hammer grip, is quite a bit of real estate. You can see even you know, in sort of a, a saber grip, I could have bigger hands, all right? So it does have quite a bit of room for my fingers, all right? It's fairly lightweight at 3.9 ounces. I think it's like 3.88 something, so, you know, round up to 3.9 ounces. Uh, and in terms of size and weight and carry, this is definitely a full-size knife. It's nice and slim to carry. It's not very heavy. It's pretty unnoticeable in pocket. Uh, and that's, those are all, by the way, good things for the kind of knife this is supposed to be. Like if you're carrying this in dress pants or uh, something, if you're carrying it, you know, you're not usually wearing like jeans or 5.11s when you're wearing carrying this. And it works well for that role. All right, let's start off with one of the things that I really like about this. And there are some things I really like that not everyone will like. So first off, it's got a Warrencliffe blade. Not everyone's in love with the Warrencliffe blade. Uh, I find them very utilitarian. They're great for EDC style blades. What I want this you know, for bushcrafting, would I want it for, you know, a defensive knife? No, not really. Uh, I know the, the Janich designs are, are Warrencliffe as well, but um, this is not meant to do everything. It's meant to do some things. And I find EDC tasks, you know, opening packages, cutting some rope, a little bit of food from time to time. This kind of blade works really, really well. That's why lots of utility knives are Warrencliffe shaped. Um, in addition to the blade shape itself being quite functional, there are some other features here that I just want to point out that I do like quite a lot. First of all, that mirrored stone wash is absolutely beautiful. I'm showing you my whole office here. Whoops, and now I'm knocking the camera over. Good job, Kevin. Sorry, guys. Let's try to get this back under control. Uh, hollow grind, very thin behind the edge. Again, is that going to make this the toughest knife imaginable? No, but it's going to make it cut like a laser, and it does. It's really, really nice from that perspective. So if you want a interesting, different, beautiful, lightweight blade that cuts well, then you'll like this. All right, if you want something big and beefy and stocky, if you want, you know, something with a belly, then this is not going to be the ideal knife for you. But if you like the blade that it has, then yeah, that's going to be a big factor. For me, I love the CTS XHP steel, great performing steel. I love the blade shape. I love the hollow grind. And I love this finish. Absolutely fantastic finish on this knife. So the blade, I think, is quite a win. 
Next, let's talk about lockup and deployment. This is one of the things, again, that people did not love, and I totally get it. Notice here on the lock side, you cannot access that spidey hole. All right. Um, I will say for my own purposes and to keep this consistent with a swayback, I'm glad this doesn't have a giant hump right here. Uh, I kind of hate when spider code does that. Um, this is definitely from a, a design standpoint, a better way to go. Spyderco has a few knives out there. The, the Spydercos that I really, really hate, that I think look so ridiculous they should have never been made, those are all the Spydercos where the design does not accommodate the spider hole very well, and they decided to put a giant lump here and put it in anyway. I That drives me insane, okay? So I'm glad to see that they didn't do it on this, and does that mean I can't spider flick the knife? Yes, it does. Do I care? Not really. Uh, you know, for me, a spidey flick is enjoyable, but it, does the knife have to be able to do that in order for me to like it? No. If it has to be able to do that in order for you to like it, then again, that would be a good reason not to buy this knife, okay? Um, you know, if you enjoy... You're, if you enjoy, you know, a Sabenza, uh, if you enjoy many lockbacks that, that, you know, are maybe two-handed opening, and uh, if you, you know, if you enjoy, if you can get joy out of a knife that can't flick open, then you may enjoy this. If a blade has to be able to flick open for you, then this is, this is not your knife. All right. The action is smooth. The lock bar is quite accessible and comfortable. All right. Uh, it is, you know, from, from a quality standpoint and a feel and a satisfaction standpoint, I actually find this very good. I do want to discuss one thing, and I left my light just a little out of reach. Let me just grab it because I want to show you something that's kind of interesting that happens on this knife. So the way the stop pins work on this knife are, is rather interesting. So let's see if I can show you. Uh, let's see here. Maybe I'll do Firefly mode. Maybe that'll work. Okay, that's just enough light. So you can see one stop pin here by my finger. You can't really see the other one. Uh, you can probably see it. Maybe not. If you look in here, but maybe not. So let's let's take a peek at the back of the blade. So there is one milled out slot for one of the stop pins, and it's going to be coming around here right now. On the other side, notice, there's a slot, but it's opposite. This one runs this way, okay, around this side of the pivot. This one runs this way on this side of the pivot, and there are two pins, one at the top. Let's see if I can show you the top one. Yep, you can, there you go. So there's the one at the top. Let's see if I can show you the bottom one. I don't know if it'll work as well. There it is right there. Okay, so you can see, so there's a stop pin on this side and there's a stop pin on this side and they kind of chase each other. They're opposing rather than side by side, which is what we often see. So kind of a cool way of getting that done. Uh, in addition to, you know, other than the way those, st those stop pins work, it's a phosphor bronze uh, bearing system and it's it's quite smooth and quite enjoyable. The bearings are a little small and that's going to always be a complaint of mine. Um, you know, having having used the the Sebenza options, I just think that's the best way of doing phosphor bronze bearing washers, and I kind of wish everyone would adopt that. So I am going to complain a little bit about the fact that the washers on this are quite minuscule. Okay, does that ruin the knife in any way? No, not really. Um, it does make the knife very comfortable, and again, this is not meant to be sort of a hard use tactical folder. Uh, you know, so I can't say a whole lot to complain about that. All right. In terms of how it feels and how it functions, very, very good. Uh, in terms of that interesting mechanical choice that they made, I think that's pretty neat as well. All right. Uh, notice, I, this is something I do love. So the end of this lock bar is nice and clean. There's no screw. It does have an insert. It's totally done from the opposite side, which I think is really, really the best way of doing this. It just makes the design so clean and so elegant. And I think that's important in a knife like this. Those little details and getting the knife, uh, just, just thinking things through carefully and doing things in a way that keeps the design... Um, clean and simple are, are important for a knife like this. And that's one really, really cool way of doing that. They probably could have been a little more consistent by putting the relief cut on the inside as well. 
that's not as big of an issue to me. All right, uh, so that's lockup and deployment. I wanted to have that little bit of a discussion so that uh, you could appreciate some of the more interesting details of the knife. Let's move on now to the handle. We've pretty much covered everything else. And so we've got to address one more sort of, I guess, two more sort of issues that people have talked about a little. First of all, let me say I love the finish on this. I love the cleanness of it. I love that the way that stone wash is done. I love the 3D machining. Just really, really nice in all of those aspects. Um, does the Spidey Clip kind of take me out of that world a little bit? Yes, it does, right? It, this looks so refined and so interesting and so clean and simple. And then the spider clip, you know, kind of doesn't fit that whole aesthetic. Now, there are other options, tons and tons of other options. I did try this for a couple of, for, for a short time with uh, an MXG clip on it. I didn't like it. I'm sure if I spent enough time and energy, I could find the clip, the aftermarket clip that I thought was just perfect for this. Frankly, I'm not going to spend that much time and energy because it's fine with this. All right. Uh, you know, as I look at the knife right here, just the way it's sitting in front of you, and, and I've kind of put, taken my hands out of the picture so you can just appreciate the, the tableau that's created, uh, I think it looks fine, right? Does it look as as clean and cool as this side? Sorry, guys. I don't know what is happening with my tripod. It's really bugging me. Um, but does it look as clean and, and sort of uh, precise and simple as this side does? Not really. Sorry, guys, I'm going to fix the background there. But it doesn't completely ruin the knife for me. And, and I don't know. Now, I know the, one of the main things that has been mentioned here is, well, why didn't they go with the wire clip? Again, this is not the Slice Bowie version 2. Um, you know, I think people go, well, you know, the Slice Bowie had the wire clip, so this one has to have the wire clip too. Well, not really. I mean, there, there are lots of clips that it could have. A milled titanium clip, I think, probably could have worked if it was exactly right. It also could have not worked. And so perhaps... Spyderco took the safest path and just put the standard Spyderco clip on it. Uh, remember the Drunken from last year, which, you know, definitely wasn't ideal in terms of that clip design. It wasn't the worst thing ever. I feel like there were some really negative reactions there as well that were maybe a little overblown. So, uh, the clip is maybe not the first choice that I would have made. Uh, I guess the wire clip could work. I don't think it needed to have it. Um, and... So yeah, I don't love the clip, but I, I don't think it's a big, big problem. What about the ergonomics? That would be more important to me. And in a saber grip, okay, the way I'm, I most often hold the knife, you can see that this does sort of catch my palm right here. Does it create a real hot spot? Not really. Okay, if, if, and if you switch to a hammer grip, which is what I would do if I was going to do some really hard pushing on this, then it kind of goes away completely. Uh, a saber grip, because so much force is on your thumb, that kind of becomes the limiting factor, at least in my usage. I always find that pushing down with my thumb, it's my thumb that's the weak point in that whole sort of equation. And so that becomes the, the point that kind of limits how hard I want to push. Again, could this have been just a little bit more rounded? Probably so. And there are some swaybacks, if you kind of look through different swayback options, traditional swayback options, that are a little more rounded here. So they could have done it. Is it the end of the world? I don't think so. You know, so that's that's sort of my my thoughts on the the ergonomics of this. Is it the most comfortable knife I've ever handled? No, right? That distinction probably goes to the 8010, but this is a very different knife, all right? So let's get that guy out of the way and carry on with the rest of our discussion, which would be in terms of some comparisons. This is a really tough thing, guys. Uh, this knife is a little different, right? It's It's it doesn't there's there's not a lot in terms of competition out there it doesn't compare to traditional swayback because it's really not a traditional swayback it it compares more to sort of gentlemanly folders and there are some of those certainly uh, i don't have the 31 that i had borrowed anymore but uh semenza 31 i think that makes an appropriate comparison 
Um, the big difference is, of course, the Savenza costs considerably more, and it's going to be much more heavily built. All right, this is not what I would call a hard use type of knife, where this or even the 21 or the 31, you can, you can put some serious use on those knives, although you're going to pay a little bit more. Another knife that this kind of makes me think of, and this is probably more in keeping, is the uh, Zero Tolerance 0707. Why do I think of this? Because the 707 is very lightweight. It's more of a gentleman's titanium frame lock. It, it doesn't quite meet all the expectations that people have for it because of the double detent system. And so these two, I feel like, are probably a little more comparable in that, you know, they're very lightweight, they're very gentlemanly, they're, they're sort of uh, taking a different approach to the pocket knife, almost, you know, trying to fit into that, that sort of Benchmade bug out trend where it's got to be small and light and, and almost disappear in pocket. All right, uh, so these would po possibly be a little more comparable, and I would even consider them to be pretty, um, how would you say this, uh, almost, almost competitors, but maybe not quite, because of the, you know, the, the 0707 is perhaps a little more vanilla than the, uh, than the Swayback is, all right? Let's let's pull in a couple of other. I guess one thing we should do is throw a para two in here, okay? And the para two I want to bring in here because the para two does all the stuff that we sort of want, okay? It's fairly comfortable. The action is enjoyable. It's you know it's very fidget friendly, very flickable. It's a little more versatile in terms of you know can this be a bit of a harder use knife? Absolutely. Where would I put this one in a harder use role? Probably, probably not. The ergonomics are a little better for that kind of harder cutting task. All right, so I wanted to kind of bring this in because this, you know, if you have this and you're expecting this out of this, you're going to be, again, you're going to be disappointed. All right, the, the Sleech Bowie was more this in a high-end titanium frame lock form. Okay, uh, let me bring in one other knife that... I enjoy an awful lot. So this is the Riot Torrent. Uh, again, another really, really nice high-end titanium frame lock. Uh, they're not super competitive. Brand new, this costs a little bit more. Now on the secondary market, they're probably a little more competitive. And this knife, I think, does some of the things that this knife does. All right, this knife, yes, it's a useful cutting tool. This knife is a useful cutting tool, but it also has quite a bit of style and flair and some really nice features, some enjoyable features that would draw people to this knife over and above just the, the sheer practical points, okay? So that's why I wanted to quickly just bring that in. Not that they're super comparable, just that there are some, some secondary considerations that may draw people to that knife. And I think there are secondary considerations that may draw people to this knife. So overall, what we have here is a very clean, simple, classy, high-end EDC. Uh, and for that role, I think this delivers in spades. I think it's really attractive. I think it's very useful. It carries well, and it's comfortable for what it's meant for. It cuts like it cuts exceptionally well. That's a benefit of the hollow grind. And it's not insanely expensive. A lot of times these good, you know, anytime Spyderco seems to do a good job with a titanium frame lock, man, you really have to pay for it. And this one is not quite as bad. I think these are like 270 retail, which is nothing to sneeze at, but it's not, you know, in the, uh, in the Chris Reeve territory, which sometimes Spyderco gets darn close to. All right, so overall, this is not a perfect knife, but it is beautiful, it's well put together, it's very useful, it carries well. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Go ahead and check out White Mountain Knives. They do have some of these in stock. You can save yourself 10%, save yourself 27 bucks, which is nothing to sneeze at. Thanks again for watching. We will talk to you soon.